this is a bit of a uh, a crayfish trap that I set up the other day in the hopes that we could catch. There's a, a type of invasive North American crayfish that's in, been introduced to Europe and it's here in the Netherlands. And I was hoping that we might be able to capture one to put in the eco displacement sculpture. But so far, no luck. My fishing hasn't gone well. This big white lesion on the tail. And another here. And another there. So that's, that's really strange. And one of the reasons why you'd want to do something like this is this kind of biological monitoring is when you find different species, they tell you stories. They tell you the story of the ecological health of ecosystems. So depending on what species you see, it can tell you if the water is fairly clean or if the water's a bit dirty. So this is the fourth fish that I've caught. And already something that uh, is really kind of interesting is I'm finding them with all these lesions. Already what uh, you see, this is only the fourth fish I've caught and it's, they seem to have these lesions or tumors perhaps or cysts. So it's one, two, three. If you can see the little bits of abnormal tissue growth. And here there's a fourth on this side. That's, I've not seen that before um, in this species anywhere else. So really curious to see what could be causing that here in the canal. And it's something um, hopefully over the next few weeks I can talk to ichthyologists uh, local to the region and see if that's something they've seen before. Perhaps it's a parasite or uh, it's hard to say. Welcome to the exhibition Seasons in Hell. Uh, this is really the culmination of uh, a little over or approximately 18 years worth of work and different bodies of work that represent uh, my art as it's changed over time and as I've focused on different uh, environmental ecological issues and different species that uh, I've been quite concerned with. And uh, I'm an artist but also a biologist and try to so integrate these fields through a form of kind of environmental or ecosystem activism to reach out and engage the public. Um, so the first thing that you see when you walk into the exhibition is, is the series entitled Season in Hell, uh, named after the poem by Arthur Rimbaud. And this, in a, in, a, in a sense, is a body of work that tries to synthesize some of the ideas that were presented by Rachel Carlson in Silent Spring, this metaphor for what happens when in the spring, the, the, the environment becomes so contaminated with pesticides and pollutants that there are no longer birds migrating through because they're all gone. So there's this terrible silence. And it's something that I, I read this book many years ago and it really impacted uh, my way of thinking. Uh, so what we see with the Season in Hell series, the photograph behind me, is one of them. Uh, it's literally uh, what the, the two birds are is they're hatchling. Uh, so, um, red-winged blackbirds that I found dead uh, for an unknown reason in upstate New York. So the idea that there were two of them from the same nest, instead, sometimes one will die and this is kind of quite natural, but the idea that two implies something more dramatic, either an attack by a predator or they were diseased or something, some kind of parental behavior pushed them out. So it's this, this kind of mystery. And then also in poetry, art, music, Birds are always depicted with flight, the ability to fly. That's what makes them so magical in our imagination. So you, in this case, the ability to fly has been taken away, uh, in this case, with an untimely death. Um, also in the series, uh, there are those that are laboratory induced, so literally their wings never grew. And so these were experiments that I didn't conduct, but experiments that were conducted in a laboratory that I was sharing um, earlier. And they were looking at the way that certain chemicals like certain pesticides literally could combine in an embryo and knock out the ability for limbs to form. And this is what we were quite concerned about with finding some of the amphibians, which we'll look at a little bit later with no limbs. Uh, but I found the, 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 the embryonic birds incredibly captivating as subjects. Just again, this idea at a different, coming from a different angle, the idea of a bird never reaching or having the ability to fly. And, 
what this means from a poetic standpoint. As we move into the second room of the exhibition, viewers will see a series called Titans, or Titans, which is the, an ongoing series that began in 2012. And the, the title depicts this notion that uh, in Greek mythology of these ancient deities, they were called the Titans, which were before the Olympiads, they were more natural spirits or dealt with natural elements, the sky or water and Gaia itself, the earth. And then over time, what happened is this shift between nature-based deities to more human-like. The Olympians came and they overthrew the Titans and they banished the Titans to austere landscapes. So these, metaphorically, I like this very much because what I found is all over the world, and we see this as in, in ecosystems everywhere, as environments are becoming more contaminated, some species are surviving, even thriving. So as a result from climate change, uh, pollution, degradation, and this is one such species. So this is a type of stickleback found in France, and these were found, it's a fish, a uh, quite ancient fish. So a fish that literally is found in North America, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, in Eurasia. So literally this fish is, as a species has dated back millions of years. So what we know from this is it's an ancient, truly, kind of primordial organism that's not just surviving, but actually thriving in the habitats that were kind of abandoned, those that we've degraded. Uh, so this idea that somehow these nature deities are there in the background. They're growing and they're thriving, perhaps because other organisms can't, and perhaps they'll be here much longer than our own if we're not careful. Now we're standing in front of an installation called Prelude to the Collapse of the North Atlantic. And literally what it is, it's a, a sculptural expression of the idea of the ever-increasing damage that's happening to the Northeast Atlantic fisheries and the food chain, uh, literally because of overfishing, habitat degradation, pollution. Uh, we're seeing just like a tremendous number of species that are literally being removed from the, the trophic pyramid, the food pyramid, the interconnection between all of these species. So literally, they're, they're preserved specimens that were collected uh, in France last year preserved uh, in kind of a, a natural history uh, collection format, uh, exhibited in ethanol, but also empty jars to represent species that have disappeared already or are on the verge of decline. And what happens is the more empty jars you get, the further along you go, you realize that we're quite working our way. We're literally kind of eating our way through the food chain or destroying the food chain as it goes along. So it's literally on the verge of collapse. Um, Unfortunately, this piece is specific to the Northeast Atlantic, but you could take this and plug it into almost any fishery on the planet at this point. Globally, we're just doing this everywhere. Uh, whether it's you're looking at the, the Pacific Coast, or if you're looking at uh, the, you know, the Nigeria Delta, or the Gulf of Mexico, for example. This is a really good example. And there's another piece in the exhibition called Committed, which is a video work that relates to the contamination from the 2010 Deepwater Horizon oil spill uh, in the Gulf of Mexico from British Petroleum. In that case, with that work, uh, literally I worked with a team of people, um, actually a, a group of hacktivists too, and we were able to kind of, uh, how do you say, appropriate the videos from British Petroleum that they were using uh, to literally kind of brainwash the population, explaining to people how everything had been cleaned up and everything is fine, uh, which is another lie. Um, the, the oil spill at best, probably only about half the oil has been cleaned from the Gulf of Mexico at this point. And secondly, they used a chemical dispersant, which made the oil much more toxic, which will have much more long-term impact than just the oil itself. And this is what we already see. So in the video, what we did is the commercials are playing, the advertisements, uh, and then we found literally line by line scientific studies demonstrating what they're saying is not true. And also going along with the piece as, a, as an appendix which people can read through and find the information themselves. And hopefully that encourages people to just really start to ask questions and then do their own research, come to their own opinions. Don't just believe what you're told. Okay, so now we're actually looking at some of the oldest work in the exhibition, really kind of the first works uh, that I started creating that were really dealing with um, very directly with environmental issues. And this really came about uh, in the, like around 1995, 1996, when as a young 
art student graduate uh, who had a keen interest in science. I always loved biology and animals and I had a laboratory growing up in my parents' basement, but I had a painting studio in my parents' barn. So I was always quite keen to somehow join these two interests together. And then in the late or the middle 90s, a group of Minnesota school children found these horrifically deformed amphibians and the, the photographs went all over, like in newspapers around the world, and they were on the, in the media, they were on, in the headlines, and I just saw them and I was so shocked and so concerned, and then later very angry that somehow this was happening, and I wanted to somehow get involved, so I literally took all of my old art and <laughs> literally glued it all together with rabbit skin glue and uh, house paint and other material and then uh, chopped it up and started going to the sites where these frogs were being found and doing these small portraits of them as I was seeing them. Uh, so literally the, the material that you see, it's, it's kind of repurposed art, um, removed and then the, the figure in this case, the, the, the individual frog, the, the portrait of the frog, it's uh, coffee, cigarette ashes, and, and water from the site. So literally, they were kind of a form of portraits. And just over time, this really evolved. I went from going to the sites to being a volunteer doing field research, to working in a laboratory part-time and coordinating field research, and then taking science classes along the way, and just really trying to get to the point that I could have an active voice, if you will, uh, not only in the arts community, but also in the scientific community, and in particular studying the, the, the decline of amphibians all over the world. Because literally in the past probably 50 years, 40% of them on the planet have disappeared. And this is really, uh, really something we have to get to the bottom of and try to do whatever we can to protect them and other species along the way. So as we go from the last room where you're seeing some of the oldest works in the exhibition, or actually the oldest work in the exhibition, this is also some of the newest work. So what happened over time is I went from doing these miniature portraits, these kind of life-size portraits, to realizing that scale was a really important aspect, or could be an important aspect to this work. So I developed this, uh, or I learned this technique, and I further developed it in different ways, which is just called clearing and staining, which is a chemical process by which you literally can transform a specimen, a preserved specimen, by staining the cartilage blue and staining calcified tissue like bone red, and then using digestive enzymes and bleaches to make the rest of the organism transparent. So it's not an x-ray, but it's actually what the specimen inevitably looks like. And we have some of those in the exhibition, some of the actual specimens in a different installation. So then, once they've been cleared and stained, I do a, a scanning and a photographic technique and then layer it together and then print them roughly the size of a human child, so the size of a toddler, uh, in the hope that this is more about invoking empathy in the viewer and not fear or disgust. I, I've m made the mistake of printing them quite large at one point and they were horrifying and I don't want to make monsters. I actually just want to show kind of the monstrous conditions we're putting other life forms in uh, just through our behavior. So a lot of the work in the, the exhibition really deals with a, the kind of sombering side of uh, kind of human impact on the environment and hopefully questioning our individual behavior and collective behavior and the way it's impacting the environment. But this one and some of the other works also are literally about a celebration of life and literally the kind of life that surrounds us, even in urban settings. So on the outside, what we've really done is literally transform, have transformed the whole museum into an artwork uh, called Love Motel for Insects, Het Domain Variation. It's part of an ongoing body of work that started in 2001 in Costa Rica. We're literally using ultraviolet lights. I can attract all kinds of different arthropods, insects. So it doesn't hurt them, but literally they're attracted and they come, they gather, they find other insects, they make more insects, and I invite people to come and celebrate this and watch and learn a little bit more about nocturnal biodiversity, a side of nature that perhaps none of us take the time to really look at. So part of the whole celebration with the exhibition is hopefully getting people inspired to look at local nature, to care about it and help protect it.